Welcome everybody to the live recording of this Africa conversation. Our special guest is Omar Barada, who is a writer and curator and the director of the Dar El Ma'moun Foundation or nonprofit, a library and artist residency in Marrakesh. His work focuses on the politics of translation and intergenerational transmission. He's the author of the po poetry collective Colonial Hum. Um, and the editor or, or co-editor of several books, which we'll discuss today, including The Africans, a volume on racial dynamics in North Africa. And a, I don't know how to say this, and my French is awful. Uh, uh, the one about Ahmed Bunani, which we're gonna talk um, about. I have to ask you to unmute, that's right. It's called La Septième Porte, The Seventh Gate. <laughs> the Seventh Gate, thank you so much. I'm, a, I'm an embarrassing Lebanese person, uh, which is a posthumous history of Moroccan cinema, Ahmed Bounani's, uh, and, written by Ahmed Bounani. Um, his writing was published in numerous exhibition, uh, exhibition catalogs, magazines, and anthologies. Ahmad, thank you so much for being a part of the series. Thank you for having me, Mikey. It's an amazing series. And I'd like to also thank Tamara and Siwa, who I've been in touch with for organizing this and have been very kind and patient and the, the powerhouses behind uh, behind the process. Um, so I'm a, maybe a good place to start is um, uh, just a biographical question. Um, you know, how did you grow up? Did you grow up loving film? Uh, did you grow up loving poetry? Did you grow up exposed to tons of film and uh, film from Morocco? Is that sort of what your uh, your your morning breakfast was? Actually, no, quite the opposite. <laughs> I grew up in Morocco. I grew up in Casablanca. Um, but these interests, I mean, poetry and film came much later. Um, I guess I grew up in a house that didn't really have books. Um, or there were books. There was one specific book, which it was a 20 volume book. It was in French. It was called La Grande Encyclopédie Larousse. It was this 20 volume encyclopedia that was, as in many places, you know, it was like a decoration. It was at the top of this um, piece of furniture that looked like a, a library that had these shelves with, you know, vases and whatever on them and a TV right in the middle. And those, the, the, that encyclopedia always seemed both um, enticing, like I, I often would climb up and pick up a volume and open, but then I wouldn't really understand what was going on inside. It was too many words, too much stuff, too scholarly. So I, di I didn't, I grew up not really knowing where, you know, where the books were, how, what, what to read and where to get the references. And there weren't like, there weren't public libraries around, for instance, when I was growing up in Casablanca. And film, I guess I was exposed to whatever was on TV, not not anything very specific. But you know, there's a there's like a lilt to the way you speak and the way you sort of I feel like even the, the way sort of you think out loud. That mm -hmm. is poetic by nature. And there it's sort of like every time I hear you, I've listened, I've listened to a lot of your lectures. Every time I hear you speak, I feel like it. It, like the words like flowed out of, out of your mouth. So what poetry or what poetry were you exposed to, even if it wasn't sort of capital P poetry? Um, what made you love language? What made you think about, um, uh, attracted you to this discipline, to the visual arts, uh, to language in general? It was all a, a series of, I mean, of, of encounters, of chance uh, things, but it was also, I mean, my exposure to poetry, I guess, was in Arabic and French initially. I mean, I was educated in, in those two languages, mostly Arabic first, mostly Ar French afterwards, uh, but it was always a school kind of exposure, right? Like we read maybe uh, in Arabic class, we read some Baudelaire in French class, those kinds of things. But my real kind of, discovery as it were or like love or penchant for poetry came with the English language actually interestingly it came you know I started learning language as a you know maybe when I was 12 or 13 or something like that and I was I remember I was in um, 
Worthing, this town in the south of England, for three weeks to take English classes, like a kind of immersion, living in a family in the summer. And Worthing is known for being the town where, um, you know, if, if anybody has read that play by Oscar Wilde, The Importance of Being Earnest, that's where the baby is found in a suitcase in the Worthing train station. <laughs> so that was... What a claim to fame. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but so I spent three weeks there and we had these English classes in the morning. And one of the teachers was this Irishman who taught us by having us read poems by William Butler Yeats, the Irish mm, poet. Yeah. And he had us read three poems and I still remember them and I could probably recite them by heart. And I wasn't really understanding what they were saying, but I was bewitched. I was completely smitten. I mean, I didn't know mm. what was going on, but there was something there in the language. There was something there, maybe because there was no school exercise associated to it, right? It was the curiosity of discovering language in action in these ways that I wasn't used to, that kind of created a lasting impression. So when I went back to Morocco, I started looking for Yeats, you know, more poems by Yeats. Uh, I went to, I found the library and I, I didn't find Yeats, but I found Walt Whitman. So I was reading Walt Whitman. And then there's this story I was, um, I told recently, which is that the summer after that, um, some friends of my parents lent them their beach house for a week to spend a week of vacation at the beach. And it turns out that the wife in the couple that lent us the house was an English uh, language and literature teacher and that house had a big like Norton anthology of American poetry in it something a book like that and so my my uh, siblings and my parents were at the beach all day every day and I stayed in the house basically all day every day and what I did was copy by hand in this notebook as much as I could from the anthology uh, as many poems as I could because I didn't know if I would ever see those poems again you know as I said I didn't know you know where where I could find that material. Uh, and I still have that notebook somewhere. It has lots of Whitman and Dickinson and Frost and, and all sorts of minor poets because I didn't really have the tools to discriminate between what was you know, uh, great and what was less great. What a beautiful story. Did your, did your parents like stumble back and be like, what, what are you doing? I mean, I guess they probably wondered, but that, that's a great thing about my parents. They, they, you know, they wonder, sometimes they wonder out loud, but they still let you do what you yeah. need to be doing. So, so, and that yeah. happened many times in my life and I'm grateful to them for that. Amazing. Um, okay, so I kind of want to talk a little bit about, um, about one of the projects that I mentioned in the intro, which is um, this amazing organization that you've been involved with um, mm -hmm. that, and I'll, I'll just read the, read the byline. Um, uh, Dar al Mamoun supports emerging Moroccan artists and promotes cultural awareness internationally. Um, I wonder if you can sort of help paint the picture. What is it like right now for mm -hmm. quote unquote emerging Moroccan artists in Morocco, whether they're translators or writers or musicians or um, visual artists? Um, what is the sort of the state of the art world um, and, and why do these communities matter so much? Yeah, big question. I should say, Dar al Ma'mun, um, it's funny that byline, I, I don't know when, when it is from and where it is from, but I, I should just contextualize. Dar al Ma'mun was born maybe in 2010, mm -hmm. so 12 years ago. And, and the idea was it was it was not a very formed idea at the beginning, but the but the main thrust was that we were thinking we were realizing that culture or our art the art sphere in Morocco was very much dependent on things like festivals. And there were lots of festivals all the time, and it was easy to get sponsorship for a three day festival of music or this or that. But then and so it, it draws in audiences and money and tourism. But then and then it goes away, and so that didn't translate into anything in terms of support, in terms of uh, ongoing, the ongoing work of nurturing a scene or nurturing a generation of artists. And so we were trying to figure out what it, you know, what, what it would take and you know, what, it, what it means to work long-term rather than in terms of these events. And so that's how it was born. And there was somebody who had some money and who was ready to invest in a project like that and uh, which allowed us 
to begin. And the idea of Dar al Ma'mun is that it was a number of things, like a library. And that was like the, one of the highlights of my life is I was given free reign to start a library from scratch. So basically I handpicked 10,000 books, which was- Please, <laughs> please tell me you put Norton's anthology. <laughs> please tell me, don't tell me you missed that opportunity. Uh, there I don't know if it's that one and I don't know if I still had the reference, but there are some anthologies, yes. <laughs> and it's a trilingual library. It has Arabic, French, and English. And- and it, it's, the idea was to also start an, an artist residency or a multidisciplinary residency. Artists, sure. writers. Um, I mean, you can see there were musicians sometimes. In the in the other slide, there was Ma'an Abu Talib, who's a Palestinian Jordanian writer. We hosted um, an, an Najwa Barakat. So we hosted uh, the kind of these writing workshops. Um, it it was interesting for me in terms of realizing what a physical space makes possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm yeah. saying this on Zoom, obviously, but the fact that we had a space, a, a library that was a kind of a safe space for everyone. We, it was really kind of like you would find students from Marrakesh, people who were just looking for a book, people who'd spend the whole day, people from the neighboring village, and they would coexist in the space and nobody, would, you know, and it would be kind of safe for everyone and everybody. And it was also, I insisted from the beginning that it had to be a lending library, sure. so not a place where you have to come and you're, you, somebody's looking over your shoulder to make sure you're not doing something wrong. So yeah. you, you can come, you can stay, you can ask questions, you can also take the book home and it's for free and there was no membership fee or anything like that. And people kept telling me you should put in, you know, those alarms at the door and have the books, you know, like protected and all that. And I, I always said no, because my point really with the library was in a way to, to kind of give access and also to desacralize yeah. the relationship to books. I mean, I grew up not having libraries around and there are very yeah. few library, public, functioning public free libraries around in a place like Morocco to this day. So I thought it was really important if we had the resources to make one happen, yeah. that everybody should feel welcome and not yeah. surveilled really. Yeah. it's like. If there are people who care enough about this poetry and this the the books on the shelves that they want to steal these or take them without permission, and you have engendered this type of enthusiasm in the community that people are trying to take them without permission, then you've probably succeeded, um, and so that's great. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about capital M Moroccan capital M cinema uh, uh, F film. Um, walk me through, if you will, how you think a film in Morocco, of Morocco, and about Morocco has sort of changed over the course of, in your mind, over the course of your life. Um, you know, what is this sort of genre, if it is a genre, how do, how do you currently think of sort of this uh, cinema of, about, and from Morocco, you've, you've been involved in a bunch of different projects about this. So I'd love, to, I know it's a broad question, but help me try to understand it the, the way you have over the course of your uh, career. Yeah, I mean, cinema is really not something that I was expecting to be as involved in as I have become. I mean, this book that you're showing, pages from Album Cinematheque de Tanger, is, is a book that I co-edited with Ito Barada and came out in 2012, so 10 years ago. And it was really, um, and it centers around the project that was the Cinematheque of Tangier that Ito co-founded a few years before that. And the idea was to, to kind of look at Tangier as, you know, at, you know um, about to look at film in Tangier and Tangier on film, because a city like Tangier in the history of film has been a place onto which a lot of, fantasies have been projected right sure. like there's so many films and and literature i mean there's there's this book um that i read a long time ago and it was in french but its title it was like um tangier the literary colonization of a city and so it's like you say tangier and you think paul bulls and you think burrows and you think this and you think that and and you forget that there are also people in tangier from tangier 
who think and write and have imaginaries and all of that, but they get kind of covered up by these other powerful and powerfully distributed images, including yeah. within within Morocco, including for us. So, so, so making this book was first was, was at least a couple of different things. One was to look at that history of all those films that have Tangier in the title of them and they have these European or American film stars and they have amazing posters and, and great, you know, film stills and, and very interesting, if very repetitive stories um, for what they tell about these imaginaries and, and their Orientalism and all of that. Um, and also, but also to look at how um, Moroccan films developed at a later stage um, and to look at the archives of the Cinémathèque de Tanger, because what the Cinémathèque de Tanger is, is like this kind of artist run institution that took on the idea of renov renovating and relaunching a film theater that was from, that existed from the late thirties and that was going to close down and probably be demolished. And, and it, so it was the idea of making an art house film theater and constituting some kind of, a, of an archive that wouldn't be too much of an institutional archive. It was like an alternative institution of film in the city of Tangier. So, and, and so in the, in the book, we reproduce a lot of the, it's like a material history of film in Tangier. You know, the old film tickets, the notebooks on which film viewers would write down their, their observations or yeah. filmographies. And, and one of the texts that I, that I very much love in this book and that I think is the central piece in it is this oral history. Um, we had somebody do interviews with 10 different people in Tangier of, of different generations about their experience of watching movies in Tangier, the old theaters, um, how much it costs to go to the movies. Do you, you know, what, there are some people who are from poor uh, families who would let go of their pocket money to buy a sandwich and go to, to such or such movie. What kinds of movies did people watch? You know, the, the Bollywood films or the Kung Fu films or the American films, et cetera. And, and you realize also that, uh, and this I realized often is that Moroccan films were not all that visible in Morocco, you know, like the, yeah. the kind of the kind of films that that I now consider an essential part of our filmography, that the important kind of auteur films in a way that we have have had a really hard time being seen in general and being distributed in Morocco in particular. Yeah. Like even well, when they'd been to festivals abroad and all of that. That's interesting. So that in some ways that even challenges your own your own understanding of what like Moroccan film is, right? Because if if there's no like local viewership at all, then it sort of challenges that idea. It has changed and it is changing, but it, but but to constitute a sense of what um, Moroccan cinema is or might be, I mean, I've had to work. I've had to work yeah. and I've had to edit these books and do some research yeah. and and speak to many others, obviously. Yeah, it's interesting, like because. So I'm, I'm I'm calling from Beirut right now, and uh, as a kid, in my mind, the, the like the most Lebanese band I knew, in my mind, was like Metallica, honestly, right? <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> because like every single kid I knew who cared about who cared about music at the time, either was listening to like Tupac or was listening to Metallica. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, like in my mind, the most like Lebanese song to play, <laughs> it's like Enter, it's like Enter Sandman, <laughs> but um, and so it's like, it, I mean, it I could say yeah, the most, idea, the most right? Moroccan actor filmmaker I, I knew in my childhood was like Bruce Lee. I mean, yeah, exactly. So I grew up on a street that had two movie theaters actually in, in Casablanca, and I, I I started going pretty late because my parents were not comfortable with just letting me go to the, yeah, the movies, sure. but they would, they would have these double bills in the afternoon. So there'd be a 2 p.m. movie and a 4 p.m. movie. Yeah. And, and that from the times that I remember going, it would be one Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee film, and then one American, you know, like Tom Cruise or whatever, something sure. like that. The, the Military Academy or something, you know, I can't remember what those films were called. Police Academy. Police Academy, yeah. So, th so that was um, generally what, what I was exposed to in those spaces. There were probably other things showing in other places. They were, there was a heyday of um, 
film clubs, but sure. that was a little earlier, maybe in the 70s. Uh, and that had receded also, I think, because of a certain amount of censorship and political violence that was going on. I mean, from the yeah. early mid 70s, we had the the kind of the high point of what we called the years of lead in Morocco with with the um, uh, regime of Hassan II kind of cracking down on intellectuals and artists who'd, who'd um, um, gotten into the habit of taking too much, too many liberties. Yeah. Okay, I want to move on to another of your book projects, which you're sort of working on or most sort of concerned with lately. Mm. So for those who can't see the screen, I have a, a black and white image of a gentleman who I had never heard of before uh, getting ready for this interview, Ahmed Bonani. And um, one of, uh, and this book project that you've been involved with, tell us who is this, this character? Um, and why are you, what is sort of this, this book about? Yeah, Ahmed Bonani is kind of like one of the central characters of my life now in the last 10 years. He's, he's, um, he's like a, he's like an, the, he's like an, the intellectual father I never had in a way. Um, he, so he's, he was a writer, a filmmaker, an artist. He was born in 1938. Uh, so just to give a sense, he was educated during a time when Morocco was a French protectorate. So he would, he received this kind of, um, at school at least, this kind of French education. But then when Morocco gained its independence in 56, he was 18. So in terms of his adult life and his practice as an artist and the beginnings of his artisthood, let's say, he was among a generation of people who were... Um, um, grappling with the fact of what to do, what to write, what to film in a place that had recently become at least on the surface free. And, and what does that mean? And, and for him, it meant all sorts of different things. Like in terms of this book that, that um, we can see on the screen, La Septième Porte, The Seventh Gate, a history of cinema in Morocco from 1907 to 1986. It's a book that he wrote in the 80s and, and he was trying to kind of look at what this, the situation was in terms of Moroccan cinema around then, you know, 30 years after independence. And what he does is a couple of different things. He, he starts with a chapter, a fairly long chapter called The Col Colonial Night, which is that he, it's this idea that film came to Morocco with the tanks of the French army, essentially. Video cameras came with the tanks. So yeah. the birth of film, the birth of moving images in a territory like ours is inseparable from um, colonial conquest and therefore from a gaze that looks at us uh, from above, that looks at us with a certain amount of contempt and that, and, that, and that is constructing images that are meant to justify the colonial project, that are showing, you know, a, a people a chaotic place that we are coming to civilize, basically. And so he's looking at the image that a few decades of European colonial filmmaking have constituted of Morocco and of Moroccan people. And therefore, the image of ourselves that people had, but that ourselves had, because Moroccans would go to film theaters and when they would see Morocco, that's what they would see. So what then the book goes on to try and do is to see the conditions in which the birth of something that may or may not be called a national cinema is happening. Like he's looking at the very difficult birth of a self image. Like he says, I'm not interested in making we Moroccan filmmakers, I mean, the point is not for us to make a masterpiece. The point is to, to be able to see ourselves. The point is to be able to give an audience an, a true image of, of their society in all its diversity, et cetera. And so he's, he calls this decolonizing the screen already at the time. And he's, he's trying to figure out how to do that. And he's trying to articulate why that is so difficult. So in the time in which he's writing, and especially for the first couple of decades of, of post-independence Moroccan filmmaking, there are very few films because the means to make films are not really available. So there's, you know, so he can basically look at each film and analyze it. And he's very critical about a lot of them, including his own. 
And um, some people, you know, are not very happy about this, that we published this book because it's very critical about their films, but, the, but that's not the point at all. The point was not to say this person is a bad filmmaker and that person is a bad filmmaker. The point is to say the conditions, you know, the conditions are not reunited or are not gathered to, um, to, to decolonize the screen quite yet. And, and yeah. uh, so he's looking at the films aesthetically, he's looking at conditions of production, he's looking at the credits and the actors, he's looking at distribution, he's looking at all of these, um, at all of these things. So it's, it's essentially he's like, um, don't hate the player, hate the game, essentially. Yeah, um, I mean, he's not saying that that's, that's the way I talk about it in the introduction, because I, I try to make sense of his project. This is a book that he wrote more than 30 years ago, and that, and that like much of his production remained unpublished for three decades. And so he died in 2011, yeah. which was around the time I came across his work. Um, and and I, I and a few others have been working with his daughter Tuda Bornani, who's also an artist, on his legacy, sort of on his manuscript, because we realized he published four books in his lifetime and made basically one feature film and a few short films. All, all of this very amazing, but it's a small fraction of what he produced. Like in his apartment are, I mean, I think we counted more than 80 manuscripts. You know, wow. there are novels, poetry collections, essays, histories, screenplays, everything you can think of. And they're not, these are not like little notebooks. These are, you know, full on projects that are dated, written, corrected. Uh, they're ready. Uh, so we're going through some of the material to, to try and see what are the priorities, like what needs to be published, just because, I mean, just to, um, to tell you a word about how I, I came across Boranani, I just saw his name in a kind of dictionary of Moroccan writers. Um, and I was wondering why I had never heard of him, you know, like around 2010 or something like that, or 2009. Whereas I thought I knew Moroccan literature pretty well, and um, and I was looking for this the major book, his major book that he published in his lifetime, which was called *The Hospital*, *L'Hôpital*, which is a, a novel, a short novel. And it was out of print, and it was nowhere. It wasn't even in the National Library in Morocco. I couldn't find a copy anywhere in France, even though it was published in French. It felt like a book that had been disappeared in some kind of weird way, and. I don't know if somebody was trying to disappear his work in particular, but I think it pointed me to gaps in our cultural memory, like gaps in infrastructure, gaps in the, in the preservation of a certain kind of uh, um, what I call in my bio intergenerational transmission, right? Like I felt like in, because when I found the book, I realized it was, a re it's, it's a masterpiece and I worked to make a new edition of it, publish an Arabic translation of it and get um, new directions in New York, the, the publishing house to publish an, uh, an English translation. So the book is now circulating again, but there is this idea that there is a whole generation that was asking very pointed, very precise, and very poignant questions about what it means to decolonize culturally, what it means to say, to, to, to realize that yes, we are independent politically, formally, but we are not decolonized. And, and what is our role as artists, as intellectuals, uh, and as citizens in that process that is ongoing. And to realize that that generation got those questions got silenced at a certain point you know yeah. i i say in the 70s and there are many many examples of this but it seemed to me uh and maybe the insurrections of 2011 the so-called arab spring re, to me it seemed that reopened those questions that like gave space to reopen those kinds of questions and so the question became for me in how can we reappropriate and reopen work like the work of Bornani and others uh, in terms of reestablishing links with what they were thinking of, what they had started, and, and how do we do it our own way, in a way. Would you, I mean, as a gut reaction, that story is crazy to me, that, that you stumbled upon this person and for the subsequent 10 years have realized that they have all this work that is incredible and 
and and you're still uncovering all of that. that's that's a crazy story like that's uh that, that's a movie right there right um is your gut that there are dozens of Buananis out there that are just waiting to be discovered in the liner notes? I I wouldn't say that because I think by by any standards, he is incredible. He's an incredible artist, human writer and everything. But I do think, yes, that there are a lot of, there are a lot of, um, I don't know if there are a lot of like immense ubers to be uncovered, but there's certainly a lot of incredible films, uh, books, et cetera, that are uh, forgotten. And maybe that's the way it should be. But in this case, I mean, there is a history of, yeah. of censorship behind it. There is, sure. there is, um, there are missing links that seem essential for us today. So, so if it's so for me, it's not necessarily only about. I mean, I've become very attached to him as a person and to his work in particular, and so I, I will continue to work on it. But I mean, the the question for me is, what kind of vision of Morocco? What kind of re evaluation of my own childhood in a way of my own history is he giving me access to is engaging with his work giving me access to so it could have been another but this opening it opened up an entire world for me a retrospective world but that is also a world that is um fruitful in terms of future imaginary as well yeah and, and just to, to tell you a little story it, when we so we published this book about a year ago and about six months ago, I got an email from Manuel Asin, who is the artistic director of a, a great um, documentary film festival in Spain, who, who had just read the book and wrote me that it was one of the best books on cinema he had ever read, and, and that he had just taken over the artistic direction of this festival and that he would like the main retrospective of this year's festival to be a retrospective of the beginnings of Moroccan documentary film based on this book. And would I curate it? So suddenly I had to become a film curator, which I didn't expect it. Uh, and I worked with a friend of mine, Ali Asafi, who's an amazing documentary filmmaker, is a who, filmmaker and who's created a lot of film programs and has been involved in the Bornani story uh, very closely. And, and, and we did uh, this, this, which was a first, um, uh, a kind of retrospective of 30 uh, uh, doc, documentary-ish films from the, the beginnings of, of uh, Moroccan cinema. Um, and it was the first program of that size to be presented anywhere. And it involved, you know, first um, subtitling of a number of films. It involved finding copies of films that had not been watched for a really long time. Yeah. And the, the very moving um, thing that happened with that, so Tuda Bornani, uh, Bornani's daughter was there with us and we had, so we had these six, seven sessions. And at the end of the last one, Tuda said, you know, when my father was writing that book, he wasn't sure that, the, that, that what Moroccan filmmake, filmmakers had done until then amounted to a history, you know, to a history of film, to something that made um, an ensemble like that. And she said, well, now that we've seen this retro retrospective, we know that there is one. We know that there is a history. And so the book helped us in a way reconstitute it, look at it from, from today. And yeah. hopefully we can, we will get to show it in Morocco as well. So let me put you on the spot. Um, I'm, so on the slides here, I'm showing a couple of different um, I tried to bring in all the chapters, but I don't think I got all of them. So there's a few different ranges. There's 1907 to 1956, 1956 to 1969, I guess 1969 to 80, and yeah. then 80 to 82, and 82 yeah. onwards. Yeah. Um, if, if you were, if somebody had access to every single film, they could. Um, are there five films that you think help sort of reveal the history, the quote unquote history of Moroccan cinema that you think are really, really give um, give people an insight. Maybe they mm. don't they don't give a full tour, but they show the doors through which somebody can sort of go through. Um, oh wow! If I had to pick five films, yeah, I mean you could. There are some essentials. Um, I mean Bornani's own Mirage, uh, the Mirage is, is one. It's from the late seventies. The first, the, the, the film that's considered to be the first um, 
kind of independent uh, film of value in Morocco is from 1970. It's called Wishma, uh, which which means the tattoo or the you know the body mark. Uh, it's by Hamid Benani, and and Bonani participated as as um, film editor of that film, and it was made by this collective of people. So I would say Wishma, I would say the Mirage, I would say um, Moumen Smihi's um, El Shergi, or or Violent Silence, which was made in Tangier in '75. So it's the first Moroccan feature film made in Tangier. And then I don't know, like. Like I could stay in that generation, but I mean, I guess if you wanted to go a little closer to today, you know, you could add maybe something by Leila Kilani, who's an amazing filmmaker, also from Tangier, actually. Um, I mean, it's hard to choose, but she has this incredible documentary film on on so-called illegal migration from Tangier called the the the. the, the the Dream of the Burners from 2001 or two, or she has her incredible feature film called Sur la Planche. I don't know what it's called in, but it's about these group of young women who work in a, in a shrimp factory in Tangier and it's very visceral and incredible. Um, uh, and I don't know, I would check out the work of Fauzi Ben Saidi, who's an amazing uh, filmmaker. His film, A Thousand Months, Mille Mois, Alf Shahr, from around the year 2000, um, which was his first feature film, looks at the the years of lead that I spoke about, but from the point of view of a child. So there's this child in a small town, and his father is not is absent. He left and he did never came back. And we understand that he was uh, probably abducted by the authorities, put in jail because of his political activism. But so it's like this portrait of absence due to political violence, but from the point of view of a child who doesn't actually know the events. It's very beautiful. Interesting, amazing, thanks for that. Um, I wonder if you were to have written the book now, right? Um, what are the other dates that you would use that sort of are the, um, the generation? So I have up here 82. So 82 then goes to what, and then what? Well, I mean, what Bernani was doing there is, so he has the colonial chapter, you know, goes mm -hmm. to 56, then there's 56, and then it's really by a decade. So he's doing 56 to the late 60s. And that's like a big decade because there were not all that many films after mm -hmm. all. And then he has the 70s. Yeah. And then, you know, and then he's writing this, like there are several manuscripts, but he wrote a version of this in 82 and then he completed it in 84 and 86. But so 80 to 82 was really kind of, in, in 1980, there was the beginning of, of a new phase because the National Film Center established, um, uh, what is it called? Like, um, there was a fund mm -hmm. for, um, for filmmakers, you know, like you could yeah. get money from the state to produce a film. And so the number of feature films, um, um, increased a lot from 1980. And there was also the establishment around then of the National Film Festival. So every couple of years, there would be this festival with prizes and everything. So like the, the general infrastructural atmosphere around film changed, the production increased in number. Um, and, and he was, and so 80 to 82 is that he was trying to write about the latest years as he was writing the book. And then he, when he took it on again a couple of years later, he wrote an epilogue, which goes up to 84, basically, or 86. But uh, I don't know if he was writing now, how he would have organized it. I think the... Um, I, I are there any, uh, any other sort of like pivot points in the 80s that either political pivot points, technological pivot points, thematic pivot points, um, legal changes that actually <laughs> would uh, change the sort of the... General you know, it's, I don't, I don't, actually, I don't think I can answer the question because I haven't, I, I haven't tried. The thing is that there are a lot more films now yeah. and a lot more filmmakers. And yeah. so, and so I, I, I would have to really study it to be able to come up with some kind of categorization or periodization. Yeah. I can, I can, I can list films. I can have general ideas in my head, but I would, I would not risk. Um, sure. Sure. I'm just looking at the time. I realize um, we haven't even spoken yet about two of the books I really want to speak about. One is uh, one of your poetry collections that just came out. Um, 
How do you approach putting these collections together? I'm always curious about poetry collections. Yeah, uh, for me, I mean, I haven't, I haven't and published that much poetry uh, because for the longest time I, I didn't really authorize myself to call myself a poet you know yeah. it's like it's, it's a tall it's a heavy it's a thing. tall order right it's a big label <laughs> at least yeah. um I don't at yeah, least yeah. for me it was I mean now living in the states I've been living in the states for, for seven years now and it feels much less big like in New York everybody is a poet you know like people have no qualms about calling themselves artist filmmaker poet whatever they have but just thought a- about <laughs> it and they become it so it, it gives you permission <laughs> I guess that's a I guess that's a good thing <laughs> I mean, it's it's a good and a bad thing. It's because it's it's. I, I mean, I am I'm pretty attached to a certain kind of rigor in the work, yeah. and I and I value s- slowness in the work also because I think things need time to mature, uh, and and I think there's there are too many books, including poetry books, in the world in some way. <laughs> so, so I'm not, I mean, which is fine. I mean, of course, I, I don't, I don't mind at all people publishing whatever they want to publish, but I'm not, I'm not ready to put something out in the world if I'm not, if I haven't given it the most that I could. Sure. Um, and so for me, a collection, it, it, it needs to be a book. I'm, I'm a little, for myself, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't think I can work in, in terms of like, just a number of poems put together inside a volume, you know, like separate little snippets of poetry. For me, I work in ter- in, in projects in a way. So, so a book like this is, is a very small book. Uh, some people would call it a chap book, like, you know, which is the, the yeah. contraction of chapter and book. Um, and so it's a sequence of poems around the question. And it started with, um, actually, it's a beautiful little story. I, I just got invited by a visual artist called Matthew Schrader, who's here in Brooklyn, um, who was preparing a portfolio, so an a, a assemblage of, of works to go inside a box that, that would be published by this, this um, editorial project that would publish artist projects in in the shape of a box, you know, and you open the box and you find, you know, photographs and a little sculpture and this and this and that, like editions, multiples. And usually there would be either a curator or a critic or somebody to write something to accompany the work. And and I, and um, and Matthew said, you know, you can come to my studio and I'm not really actually interested necessarily in you writing an essay about my work, which is something I do. I write about art. He said, we can talk and see what develops out of it. And uh, what developed out of it is a sequence of poems that don't really talk about his work, but that engage with his project in a way. And I really like this idea of these two artistic projects in the end coexisting uh, in, in space and time and also in the, in the box in question. Um, and what he was working on at the time was this tree called the Elanthus Altissima, otherwise known as the tree of heaven. Uh, which has been brought over to uh, what was then the American colonies, I mean, before the United States in the 18th century, from China, for all sorts of reasons. It was a pretty tree, it provided shade, but also people thought it w- they, they would be able to make silk out of it. Um, and the thing is that now uh, it has become considered an invasive species. So, so people here are trying to get rid of it. And, and I was really kind of struck by this notion of like who decides what is invasive and how can these essentially you know white Europeans uh, in the 18th century bring a tree that didn't ask them for anything all the way from China just because it pleased them and while they were themselves settlers and (laughs) and today decide in the name of something like I don't know conservation or something uh that you know, it's like it's 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 kind of strange. It's like all of these nation states that are all in essence settler states deciding that they have borders that, that nobody can enter. Uh, so I was interested yeah. in this notion of invasiveness and who constructs it and what yeah. does it mean and 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 how can settlers suddenly in the framework of of plants or nature uh, sure. defend indigeneity and. And so I really read a lot of scientific articles for this, like what is this tree? How does it grow? Yeah. 
And I like to work, I like to work with research. So I have a bibliography at the end of this poetry book that has a lot of arcane stuff in it. And I take language from it and I try to recompose it rhythmically in a way um, to, to convey something of, of these ideas that I, that I just barely started to outline with you here, but to convey them not in an expository way, but in, in the way that language um, functions rhythmically, echoes itself as it goes through in yeah. this kind of rectangular form where there is no punctuation and no capital letters. And so you have to find your way into reading it, into, into, reading, into reading the mode in which I, I compressed um, a kind of um, uh, a, 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 an exponentially growing language into these rectangular boxes that overflow into each other. Yeah, as, as a metaphor for, for invasiveness or for you know compression. And yeah. also, I wrote this at the beginning of the pandemic when we were all confined. So I was thinking about it. small little boxes up a lot. <laughs> it's funny how uh, it's funny how certain choices are just as simple as that. It's like why why are these small little boxes? It's like well, because I live in a tiny apartment and I can't help but think of being claustrophobic. <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, I love the. Um, I'm I, I'm surprised that the the book isn't just called uh, kettles, black pots, and black kettles. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we have the to do the quick questions, and um, there's so much left to talk about, but we don't have time. So let's just do the do the quick questions, and then we'll see if we have time at the end. Sure. So what are you reading or watching these days? Um, no judgment. By <laughs> uh, well, yeah, no, um, I don't I don't have anything to be ashamed of. Uh, but I, I just read um, and it was a beautiful experience because I read it with my daughter also. Um, Safia Helu's yeah. um, young adult novel called Home is Not a Country, which is a yeah. novel in verse. And I was... Um, uh, astonished by it, I thought, I thought it was very beautiful. I also was. She was on. Uh, uh, she was the first person on African Book Club, and oh, we had go. a really beautiful conversation with her. So, if you're interested in showing your daughter, the conversation was really oh, yeah. fun. She's, so she, she's amazing, and that was beautiful. And I'm also um, rereading a lot of Etel Adnan, uh, who died a few months ago, and who's somebody I was close to somebody I knew very well uh, and I met when I was in my early 20s and was very important to me and so I'm I'm um, so I have a kind of a uh, I would say an emotional attachment to the work but I'm also being asked to write about her work a lot these days before she died but also since she she died and I and I realize as I reread that there's so much in there it's such an expansive generous incredible universe uh and that is not that is often uh in the way it's talked about in general it's always a couple of points that are stressed but but there's so much in her work and so i'm trying to to just to to find new entry points um uh, into it uh, yeah. for, for myself and <laughs> for the world or for whoever cares to listen is there a, is there a, a piece that you're sort of unpacking right now Right now, I mean, I'm supposed to write an essay that's due in a few months about, and I've decided it should be about her relations to uh, her, her contemporary Arab poets. Yeah. And she had this really, she was, she like for a part of her life, she was afraid that she would not be considered an Arab poet because she had moved out of Beirut. She never wrote in Arabic because she couldn't, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but she found her own ways of being in conversation yeah. with her contemporaries who wrote in Arabic uh, and all of that. And they considered her one of their own. And I'm, and I'm interested in trying to look more specifically at those relations and, you know, like uh, her poetry was translated into Arabic by some major poets. Uh, she had this practice of the leporellos, you know, those folding mm -hmm. accordion books of where- course. She's like scribbles um, in Arabic letters. She she copies poetry uh, by uh, major Arab poets as a way to, you know, pay homage to them and also absorb their their words in 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 a, in a way. Um, yeah. And and that was kind of um, yeah. I mean, so so all of those things. I'm trying to amazing. Look at. 
Um, so who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Uh, maybe it's uh, Boranani, maybe somebody else. Uh, I feel like Boranani, I've, I've, I've come to know pretty well. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if I need to shadow him now, but uh, it, there, actually there is a person I would love to shadow for a day. Um, we didn't talk about this, but you mentioned this book uh, the Africans yeah. that I did, and I've been looking at questions of race in Morocco and trans-Saharan migrations, and I've worked a lot with Mbarak Bouachishi, who's a, an, a Moroccan artist I've, that have, has become a friend, and we did exhibitions together and this book and all of that. And it's it's part of a kind of an ongoing research project and writing project that I have about this question of, um, as, as um, uh, Shokir Hamel, there's a book by a historian Shokir Hamel called Black Morocco. So I'm trying to think about this. And in the course of researching this, I, my uh, family history caught up with me. And, and in particular, the story of my um, grandmother's grandmother, who had been brought to Morocco uh, enslaved from somewhere, uh, who was a Black woman, uh, and who my mother knew very well as a child, but who's somebody I didn't hear about when I was growing up. Uh, so, so it's kind of a fairly recent story for me that I've started thinking and writing about. And I would love to meet her, this ancestor of mine. Amazing. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Oh, I think it's... Um, People seem to have, in general, and this is not specific to me, but seem to have um, an impulse towards um, labeling or fixing. So people who have known me at a time when I translated a lot think of me as a translator and will only think of me as a translator. People who have seen exhibitions I've curated will only think of me as a curator. Uh, people who, there are people who only see me as somebody from Morocco and will only... <laughs> Yeah, um, sure. engage with that so I don't know I think people are multiple and I'm a naturally very kind of curious person I'm interested in expanding my worlds and I don't have I all of the things I do I wasn't trained in this is not at all what I studied these things so so I I think there's a misunderstanding that comes with the the, the desire to, to pigeonhole or to, or to kind of yeah, um, know what somebody is about when right. when when every person is in in flux and in progress. I can relate to that. Okay, so we have a, a question from NY. Um, are you there? Hi. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you. It, it's uh, Najwa. Uh, thank you both, Omar. What fascinating points you make. Um, one in particular really resonated with me. I'm, I'm looking at a lot of early footage of the Middle East, Palestine, um, Iraq, Syria. And uh, you, you're completely right. It, it just leaves you feeling that it's uh, um, unrepresentative. It's partially representative, lots of donkeys and camels and flea-bitten children and, and so on. Uh, and the commentaries can be disgusting when there is sound. I just wanted to know if you have come across any very early footage from anywhere in the Middle East that's not like that. Oh, I mean, it's, the, you mean early footage that was um, yeah. filmed by, by Europeans, for instance? Y yes, uh, or or uh, even better. I mean, uh, well, I mean, I mean, most of most of the the local people did not have access to means of production yes. for the most part. I would. I'm. I mean, I'm sure you can find things, and and there, are, you know, when the Lumiere brothers send their operators all around, you know, there there are a lot of images that were just that were sh um, shot, and that people have been studying. What I'm interested in is, I mean, no images are neutral, and no image can be fully representative, right? But I'm interested in ways that certain filmmakers from the region have taken on those, let's call them racist images and have made something different out of them. For instance, Buenani to speak about him again, but also Asiya Jabbar in, in Algeria did something similar. He wanted to tell the history of the, the colonial period in Morocco through film. And he realized that the only images that we have of that were the images shot by the French, by the colonizers. And so what he did is he took archives of those images and he 
um, edited them against themselves, against the grain. So he would cut and re-edit, re-sequence differently. He would eliminate the soundtrack and create his own soundtrack. And then he would film uh, a set of his own images. For instance, he would say, we, he realized that the French mainly shot Moroccans as these masses of people, groups of chaotic groups of people. And so he made some close-ups and he, for instance, he went to areas, for instance, in the Reef Mountains, where bombs were dropped by the Spanish and by the French. And he filmed people who had seen those massacres. He just filmed them. They're not speaking. You just see their eyes. You see, he films in close up the eyes that have seen the catastrophe in a way, you know, that had seen it 40 years earlier. And he inserts that inside the colonial footage. And so he gave, he, he deconstructs the colonial image and he reconstructs another one in its place by using it and and it's kind of like a, a poetic justice in some kind of way through film but I, I think there are many projects like that that are very beautiful amazing thanks Najwa Ahmad thank you so much for um taking us through all this stuff and fielding my <laughs> my questions from all over the place I really How did an hour it. go by so fast Mikey how did you I know I know, um, it's, a, it's a, a miracle. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, please give us feedback. I posted the link in the chat. This is going to go up on our podcast feed tomorrow and up on YouTube. And uh, thanks everybody. See you next week. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>